In four decades as a Navy SEAL, Admiral William McRaven learned a whole lot about leadership. He's distilled that experience into a new book called The Wisdom of the Bullfrog, Leadership Made Simple But Not Easy. McRaven speaks with Walter Isaacson about global hotspots and about an often neglected virtue, humility. Thank you, Christian and Admiral Bill McRaven. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Walter. Good to be with you. You've got this great new leadership book out called The Wisdom of the Bullfrog. You were once the bullfrog. Tell me about that and what you learned. Yeah, I was. So the, the title bullfrog is given, given to the longest serving Navy SEAL on active duty. So remember, first and foremost, as Navy SEALs, we are Navy frogmen. So when you're the longest serving Navy frogman, they, they give you the title the bullfrog. And really the book is about just the leadership lessons that I learned in my 37 years in the military and some of the lessons from my time as chancellor at UT. Let me quote from the book. I often hear it's hard to know the right thing to do. And then you say, no, it's not. No, it's not. You know what the right thing to do is. It's just hard to do it. Explain what you mean by that in the book. Yeah, you know, many times in my career, people always have these seemingly moral dilemmas. You know, should I do this or should I do that? And yet they always seem to know the answer. The answer is pretty simple. Do what is honest, do what is noble, do what is dignified, do what is respectful, do what you know to be right by your employees, by the rank and file. You know what right looks like. You just need to do it. And invariably, when people fail to do it, when they fail to do what's right, when they fail to do what is in, you know, the, the best interest of the organization and the people that work for them, invariably, they have some sort of fall or they built an organization that's, uh, that's a house of cards that tumbles at the wrong time. So do what's right. You know what it looks like. You know what right is. You just need to do it. You oversaw the raid that got Osama bin Laden. Tell me what leadership lessons you learned from that one. You know, fortunately, by the time uh, the raid came along, of course, I had been in the Navy oh, about 34 years at that point in time, and I had seen a lot. I'd been involved in about 10,000 missions, missions that I had either commanded, uh, that I'd been on, or that I had kind of overseen from afar. And so I knew what to do in terms of the leadership. And the leadership in this case was to make sure that you know, we did the mission in a simple fashion, because if you make it too complex, then in fact, the risk factor goes up. So you want to mitigate as much of the risk as possible. You have to inspire the men that are on your team. They were all men in, in this particular case. That wasn't hard to do because they were going after the most wanted man in the world. But you always have to do things that are going to, you know, uh, again, take care of the reputation the sense of duty and honor and country that is important for any military organization. So I wanted to make sure that they understood, look, when we got on target, we don't needlessly kill anybody. You only, you know, you follow the rules of engagement, you follow the law of armed conflict, you protect yourself and you protect your organization and your unit. Um, but we wanna walk away from this operation with bin Laden either captured or killed and with the dignity of the United States still intact. We're going to do things right. One of the maxims in your book involves an attribute that you don't often hear bold leaders talking about, and I think we really have a deficit of it in our politics today, and that's humility. And uh, it's a nice little chapter about building the frog float, but I do think that some of the poison in our politics today comes from the fact that we don't have enough humility to question ourselves or say, well, were we wrong? Explain yeah. what you would do about that. Well, you know, the one thing I've learned, you know, over my years of leading Walter is, uh, you know, it, it pays to be humble because you are rarely, you know, the smartest, the strongest, the fastest, uh, you know, the best seal in the boat. There's always somebody out there that's better than you are. And frankly, what we learned very early on, particularly in combat, is the nature of recognizing that, you know, the enemy, again, the enemy always has a vote. The enemy can be better. If you underplay the enemy, you're likely to get yourself into trouble. And what we tend to do is, before the Rangers or the SEALs or the Green Berets go out on a mission, everybody kind of gets together. And even if you're the leader in charge, 
you're prepared to listen to the comments about the nature of the plan. Well, is this plan good? What do you think, boss? How should we arrange this? But the real critique comes after the mission. So if a mission has not gone well, you know, and I think the Army Rangers probably do it better than anybody, they get these young troops back in the room and you know, metaphorically, they take off their collar devices so rank isn't an issue. And then everybody gets to go at each other, you know, because their lives are on the line. If they fail to listen, if they fail to improve the next time, somebody could die. So I've learned humility many, many times in my career because I've been wrong many, many times. I hope the ledger shows that I was right more than I was wrong, but it is the nature of leadership is you're gonna be wrong. So learn from your mistakes, listen better next time, you know, and, and try not to make the same mistake again. The war in Ukraine right now seems to have really hit a stalemate in some ways. I mean, it's back and forth, a lot of people dying for a very few feet of territory. Do you think that the time may have come for a ceasefire where Putin hasn't been able to gain what he needs to gain and Ukraine should uh, find some way with the United States to, f to get a ceasefire before we have a spring offensive? Yeah, I don't think so. I, I actually like the strategy that President Zelensky is putting into place now. You know, they are, they are holding the town of Bakhmut. And as you know, you know, from a military strategy standpoint, there's been a lot of debate even among Zelensky's uh, generals about the merits of Bakhmut. And probably from a you know, military strategic standpoint, it doesn't make a lot of sense to hold this small town that's, you know, it's a, it was about 70,000 people before folks have evacuated. It is a little bit of a crossroads of some rail lines and, and important roads. But at the end of the day, I think Zelensky's general said, hey boss, we need to do a withdrawal from Bakhmut because we're losing too many people. But I think Zelensky really had the, the better thought on this, which was we're gonna stand our ground in Bakhmut. And we're gonna stand our ground for a number of reasons. Because if the Russians succeed in taking Bakhmut, then it improves their morale. It will negatively affect the Ukrainian morale. It may in fact affect the European support and the US support to Ukraine if they feel like the Ukrainians aren't making progress. So I like the fact that Zelensky has, is holding, doing the best he can to hold Bakhmut. I don't think we're ready for a ceasefire just yet. You know, it needs to get to the point to, uh, you know, kind of allow the Ukrainians to start their spring offensive, to push the Russians as far as they can. And if anybody's gonna ask for a ceasefire, it ought to come from Putin first, uh, because then that's an, admit, an admittance that, uh, that they're failing. And, uh, and if they're failing, then they've really lost. And I do think the Ukrainians can win this fight. They win it by ensuring that the Russians aren't successful in building this land bridge from Donbass down to Crimea. And I do think the Ukrainians can hold territory and push the, Ukraine, uh, the Russians out just a little bit to ensure they don't build that land bridge. We've seen these leaks from the 21-year-old National Guardsman, Jack Teixeira. Uh, you've been chancellor of the University of Texas. You know 21-year-olds really well. You've been a leader of the SEALs. Tell me what was your thought when you saw this leak? Yeah, you know, the one thing I would offer is uh, we've got to be careful about overreacting to this. Obviously, the leak is horrible. Uh, it, it, there was a lot of sensitive information. But the fact of the matter is we have a lot of great 21-year-olds in the military that are doing exactly the right thing. We need to rely on these young men and women uh, because we need them in order to you know, manage the, uh, the cryptology that we're doing, to manage all of the classified uh, material that they get handed. We need them to do the hard work. So the fact that we've got one 21-year-old who uh, kind of got off the reservation, decided that uh, you know, he, he thought uh, impressing his friends was more important than protecting U.S. secrets, he needs to be held accountable. But we really need to figure out a way to be able to maintain the kind of chain of custody, Walter. I mean, this is the thing that is, has been challenging in the past. So the chain of custody for a classified piece of material. You know, when I started in the military, it was all hard copy. It was paper. So you physically had to sign. When somebody handed you a secret document, you signed a routing slip. And that meant that now you were in control of that piece of paper. Well, today, because of the electronic nature of the information, it can pass very, very quickly. But if we have a good chain of custody that says, okay, this person read it, 
this person transferred it, this person copied it, then you'd have you know less likely of a chance that that a young 21 year old can uh, can do something incredibly uh, irresponsible and put the nation at risk. One of the things that there's a consensus on in Washington is to be hawkish about China. And both parties seem to want to out hawk each other. Are we going too far in being provocative in China? And should we be trying to find more common ground with them? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, my, my position on China probably uh, diverges from a, a lot of those uh, hawkish folks out there. Because look, I, I believe we need to hold China accountable. We need to hold them accountable for the Uyghurs. We need to hold them accountable for Hong Kong, for violating the WTO, for using the Belt and Road Initiative to kind of leverage small countries. But at the same time, we need to find common ground with China. And we need to find common ground on trade. We need to find it on climate, on space, something, so that when things do get tense, we have kind of avenues of conversation. I was uh, talking to a senior official in the White House not too long ago who said they have more conversations with Russia than they do with China. Well, that's not good. The fact of the matter is the world needs China. We need Chinese human capital. We need the Chinese economy. Uh, we need what China can offer the world. Once again, you know, we need to hold them accountable. But I think we can, in fact, maintain a, a two-track engagement with China. One, hold them accountable, be strong on defense so we have a good deterrent uh, capability in the Pacific, but at the same time, build a path for some level of engagement. Because if we don't have that engagement, we are pushing China further and further into the arms of Russia. And if you have a strong Chinese and Russian alliance, that's not good for anybody in the world. Well, let's talk about that Chinese-Russian alliance. I mean, one thing Bismarck told us is that you really can't push your two adversaries closer to each other than you are with them. What can we do now, since Russia seems to be the great threat in Ukraine, to try to stop this growing alliance between Russia and China? Well, for, for one thing, it, back to the previous uh, comments, we've got to find a way to engage with China. Uh, and, and we need to have some sort of olive branch that we extend to China uh, in order to, again, begin to separate them a little bit from Russia. They, right, let, me, let me ask about that. Give me an olive branch that you would offer if you were in charge. Okay, so right, right now, climate. I mean, I, the Chinese understand that uh, the climate change is an issue. Uh, let's at least start with something simple that is uh, that I think both countries can agree on. Let's, let's try to fix the climate problem. Okay, we won't probably get very far on that, but at least we can have a conversation. Let's talk about the South China Sea, the concerns about the Chinese kind of aggressive activities in the South China Sea. What's happening now is things are beginning to escalate. Of course, we are you know, partnering closer with our allies in the Philippines, which is good, but we're gonna establish bases in the Philippines. So now everybody's beginning to ratchet up uh, the level of engagement in the South China Sea. Well, let's find a way to kind of lower the heat there. Let's figure out how we can work together on trade. Uh, I think there's a number of opportunities out there uh, where China would be willing to engage. You know, the fact of the matter is she has been you know, trying a couple of times uh, this charm offensive. You know, he's kind of brokered the, a little bit of the peace agreement there between Iran and Saudi Arabia. He is, of course, trying to broker a peace agreement in, uh, in Ukraine. You know, these are opportunities where maybe we can partner with the Chinese to, to look at some ways to, again, lower the tensions globally. Are you worried about a move on Taiwan? And what can we do to prevent that? Well, I am always worried about a move on Taiwan. I do not think that it's imminent. Uh, and of course, what we're doing is we are building up uh, the Taiwanese military. We are partnering with our allies in Japan and South Korea and the Philippines to create, I think what we're hoping to create is a deterrent effect by putting more military power, both US military power and allied military power in the region. Now, once again, we've got to be careful about you know pushing too far. Uh, when you take a look at the 2023 budget and the 2024 proposed budget, it's really all about China. Uh, you know, we're buying more F-35s, more submarines, uh, more ships, uh, more things that can counter a near peer competitor. And I think that's all right. Don't misunderstand me. Uh, but we've got to make sure that it doesn't become a self-fulfilling prophecy that we end up, uh, you know, building up a military and we're looking for the enemy and the enemy just happens to be China. 
I'm all about a deterrent capability. I think that's very important, but we just need to understand that while we are building that deterrent capability, we need to be working on diplomacy as well, because the last thing China wants to do and the last thing the United States wants to do is to go to war with each other. You wrote in 2020 that the world's no longer looking up to America, and you endorsed uh, uh, Joe Biden for president at that point. How do you think he's doing, and do you think the world is looking up to America more now in the wake of the Ukraine war? Well, let's take it back even before the Ukraine war. Uh, I think the evacuation uh, out of Afghanistan was, uh, I think, uh, as the chairman said, kind of a political disaster. Now, the fact of the matter is, once the 82nd Airborne got on the ground and got organized, it was a remarkable feat of military professionalism to evacuate 132,000 Afghans in two weeks. But any way you cut it, uh, it, it did not look good in terms of American leadership internationally. Now, having said that, I will tell you that I think the administration has done a pretty good job in Ukraine. When the war first started, I thought they were a little slow on the uptake. But I think they've gotten their legs out, uh, gotten their legs underneath them, and I think they've been doing a pretty, pretty good job. So I think the world, as the world looks at the administration today, um, particularly in light of Ukraine, I, I think we have some, uh, we, we've, we've regained some credibility. Admiral Bill McRaven, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Walter. Thank you for having me.